Um, yeah, this is Bursaria spinosa, which is a, a, um, a plant that in Western Sydney dominates underneath red gum communities and um, maculata communities as well. But it's um, very, very common uh, in disturbed areas where there've been a lot of cattle and thing run through. So it's hard to tell whether it would have been at this sort of density or it's, what I'm trying to say is that it's an indicator of disturbance. And uh, there might not have been as much of this here originally as there is now. That's a little wombat path. You can see how they're churning the ground up. You can see there's a highway here that runs down to the paddock. So they'll be down there eating the grass, but they come up here to hide. Mm. This, um, this plant here, Macrosamias, uh, not this one here, but the one behind, um, often called a dinosaur plant. It was, you know, it's a very ancient plant. The Aboriginal women used to use it as a, uh, I don't think it's technically called a curette, but if they wanted to abort a, um, an unwanted pregnancy, they'd actually get the, the fruit and wash it in a river running water for a week or two and smell it. And reputedly they can smell, like if you ate it straight out you'd die or get very, very sick. But they could smell it to, you know, two or three parts per million and go, okay, I can have that now. And then that could abort an unwanted pregnancy. There would have been a, a larvae of a, a borer, an insect, that was in here. And you've got a big um, uh, cockatoo that would have come and torn this side of the part, plant apart because it smelt that um, in there. So the Aboriginal people used to actually name the plants after the grubs that were in them that they used to eat. So if they had a witchetty grub, they'd call it that tree, which made a lot of sense. Um, so I was watching some um, yellowtail black cockatoos the other day tearing apart a big punctata, a big eucalyptus punctata, and they just <laughs> ripped it apart. They was going to almost die because they'd ring bark the thing. Yeah, it's incredible how how strong they are. The other thing I looked at just a minute ago before I came is there's this species of wattle also exudes um, uh, this gum, which is food for possum species. And there's a, where the power lines come over, these are the big high voltage power lines that run over the, the road on the way in here. There's one uh, wattle there that's got these about 50, 60 little marks of this jaw where the um, possums eaten into it and created this and made it bleed and they come back and suck that up. So if you, you know that you've got uh, a possum species there by the marks, that, that type of mark on the tree. So there's quite a few species of native vines that cover over and smother the, uh, the vegetation. Sorry, can you... A jibung or pasunia. These are very tart but in, at a pinch you can eat them. I like, don't like them at all. <laughs> but uh, you know the Jibung Polo Club, this is the plant that that poem was named after. Um, beautiful plant, it's so varied. Some of the leaves are a little you know, narrow like this, some are like a, a needle. They have this beautiful yellow uh, raceme or sort of a string of flowers. And the Pinifolia is just the perfect native um, Christmas tree. It flowers at, at midsummer. Um, beautiful yellow drooping form and it looks like a pine tree. So, but yeah, really difficult to grow, like no one's really cracked the secret of how to get these to germinate properly. Yeah. This tree here and the one beside it, are, 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 they're sort of hybridised, they're a, a merging of two different species, Saligna or the Sydney blue gum and Botryoides. And they're not, they can't really tell them apart easily, they're sort of, yeah, really hard to pull apart. So there's lots of them here, anyway. And this one here is maculata. You'll see lots and lots of that. It's one one with a sort of blue flash or spotted gum, it's called. It's very, very common. Um, probably the common, the, the predominant uh, timber species in New South Wales right now. It's, it occurs all the way up and down the coast. Burn our bushland in Sydney often enough, and this plant here, which is native, is starting to take over. It's one that actually creates rainforest and Eventually the rainforest will move out and out and out until it actually kills uh, other communities. Um, but then fire burns these sorts of species back. So there's this constant movement of mesophilic species or rainforesty species into drier regions creating higher humidity, which kills the plants that are further out that don't like high humidity levels. So yeah, we have to look after this and actually kill it as part of our contracts of bush regeneration in Sydney.
is further along here, are probably dying in response to uh, a soil-borne uh, fungus-like organism called Phytophthora cinnamomai, or cinnamon fungus it's called, it's not really a fungus. And it's actually killing a lot of trees in Sydney. And in wet, where they've got sort of wetter ground, it, it gets established. But in Western Australia, they have terrible, terrible trouble with the Jarrah forest, where it's killing massive areas of Jarrah. And so it's soil from another region? Or? Yeah, you only need like a pea, mm -hmm. a pea-sized piece of soil from a, a, um, an, infected. an infected area. So we have protocols when we're working in bushland to make sure that our boots are clean. We generally so mistletoes are, are parasitic plants. They basically, uh, a, a mistletoe bird will generally eat the seed, sticky seed from a, a, um, a plant like this, and then go and sit on a tree and shit it onto the branch. And then that seed then bores its way into the tree, taps into the food that the, the phloem and xylem of that tree, and then grows itself parasitically. And then often the, 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 um, uh, they're hard to tell apart from the host plant. Often they actually mimic the, sh the, the leaf shape and everything. Not exactly, but qu often quite close. It's hard to tell them apart from the real leaf. And then it eventually can kill the tree. And they usually get into trees that are in poor condition. If they're drought uh, stricken or they've got insect problems, they're not in good health, then they're more vulnerable to to parasites like this. Remember this bird? This is a bird's nest. It ha hangs on the underside of branches. <coughs> the bird sort of comes up from underneath or in the top. But what happens is that after the, yeah, um, they often build these over water so that predators can't get to them. And then after they're disused or if they get really big and they can do, you get microbats nesting in them as well. So if we're looking for microbats, we'll always check these, see what's in them. So this is another one of the G-bungs. It's got this beautiful bark on it, like a, you know, really flaky, um, what do you eat? Like <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> no, like on cakes and things. It's, like chocolate. Yeah, it's like a filo pastry. It's just, it's a beautiful looking thing. Lovely. Something's been chewing around the base of that as well. Obviously, there's been an insect or something that they've been attacking. Um, the uh, Varanus, the um, Goannas are really big. One of the things that we've got here, which is really interesting, <coughs> I should explain just the, we'll, we'll finish our walk here. Uh, we won't get the last 15 minutes around the corner as we've got to get back to the next thing. But um, there's a few endangered species that we've found here. Uh, in fact, um, What's her name? Sue Fury uh, was walking here doing her archaeological survey uh, with an Aboriginal archaeological survey with a guy called Stephen Hill or something? Smith, I think, something like that. Um, anyway, they were walking along here looking for Aboriginal artefacts. They didn't find anything at all, virtually. Um, but they did find uh, a broad headed snake, which is a nationally listed endangered species, which loves this rocky sort of ground. So that immediately raises the, the importance of this area. Uh, then, as you'll see, I've, I've got photos of that and, <clears throat> and also of a Varanus, a, 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 um, a goanna, Rosenberg's goanna, which is an endangered species as well, listed on the Threatened Species Act. So we've got some lovely photos of that. Um, then we've also had square tail kite. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we've got powerful owl roosting on site. Uh, barking owl as well, uh, yellow-bellied glider, uh, greater glider, um, I've seen a uh, breviceps, the um, sugar glider as well. And I think the signs of that chewing on the, on the acacia that I saw before might well be uh, an eastern pygmy possum, I think. So we've got a really, really good section, cross-section of animals. I don't know of anywhere else that's got all of those things, but I've still got to prove that some of them actually live here like the square tail kite, which is also listed, which we saw, it, um, it may live, well, it does live somewhere else, but it comes and uses this area for foraging. Um, the other thing that was here was the brush-tailed rock wallaby. <clears throat> and I was just looking into it yesterday, speaking to 
the Ian Potter Foundation, mm -hmm. who've been um, funding a recovery plan for uh, the brushed rock wallaby, which used to be here, um, but it's been eaten by foxes. Yeah, there's a sm really small colony of them on the Camberwara Range. National parks are looking after them. There's about three or four animals. And uh, I'd like to actually get a, um, a breeding program going here for the rock wallaby. And they've been successfully doing it in South Australia and relocating those animals to Tidbinbilla, which is near Canberra. Yep. <coughs> and there's another relocation spot which isn't far away he from here either. I've forgotten where that was. I've looked into it. They're not, inter they're not actually interested in doing any work here or releasing any animals here. But I'll look further into it um, because we may be able to get some money for the conservation of that animal which would include, I hope, putting a fence in that we can use as a way of delineating and stopping foxes and other predators coming in which would have a double benefit in that our wombats suffer very badly from mange and the mange is brought in by foxes and other vectors. Dogs can actually carry it as well and probably overzealous people would even maybe carry it occasionally, I don't know, but we're looking into how to, we might even get into a, a, um, a mange sort of um, study here too to find out how we can actually deal with that.